of the existing system for medical cannabis and its history in Canada, and will be presented along with the available data on use. Uh, Jillian Henderson graduated with a Bachelor of Applied Arts degree in Communications from Ryerson University in Toronto. After her undergrad degree, she set out on some extended travel to Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Japan. Next, she earned a second degree, this time a Bachelor of Education from Queen's University in Kingston. Jillian worked as a high school teacher and as a pharmaceutical representative. Then in early 2016, Jillian landed her dream job as the head of medical outreach with Canadian Cannabis Clinics. She speaks publicly and educates physicians, patient advocacy groups, and community support organizations about benefits and precautions with respect to cannabis as medicine. Audience group sizes range from 5 to 150 people at a time. So please welcome Jillian to the uh, uh, podium. Thank you. Well, good after, or good morning everybody. Thank you for coming out. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm going to get right to business. So thank you for the introduction, Colette. So you are aware of our, of our topic today. I want to move that forward. There we go. Okay, learning objectives for today. We're going to talk about current legislation, short form is the ACMPR. We're going to talk about the history of cannabis in Canada and current um, usage rates and attitudes as well. And I did a deep dive into uh, literature search and survey of information. There's a lot out there, so I picked out what I feel is the most uh, pertinent for us today. And we're going to talk about sources of additional information. So the existing system today. <clears throat> so I won't go too much into the ACMPR, and I think this is a fairly educated audience, and you've probably heard about this or read about this already. But um, the key highlights that I will say is that uh, a change in the ACMPR compared to the MMPR before that is that now people can not only purchase the cannabis from the licensed producer, but they're allowed to purchase the startup materials, the seeds as well. So that was a, a nice change, a lot more leeway for people. Now, uh, purchasing marijuana from the dispensary con continues to be illegal, and uh, marijuana for recreational purposes continues to be illegal in 2017. We know that we can see that that's going to change, but today that's how it is. So what is a licensed producer? There we go. So uh, just as of last week, there are now 43 licensed producers in Canada. So it's you know, great news to see there's more diversity in the field. These LPs are highly scrutinized by Health Canada, um, uh, pharmaceutical grade standards, security is paramount and, and quality is paramount. There's clearance checks for all the staff. There's swipe cards to go through every area of a, of a licensed producer grow operation from room to room to room. So only the LPs are approved to cultivate, sell, and distribute medical cannabis in Canada today. Now I had the uh, I was fortunate enough to have a tour of a licensed producer. Um, so this is a, a photo I took in one of the big grow rooms, and this is just represents one of many in this particular facility. These facilities can range on the small end to. Um, I would say 10 to 15,000 square feet. There's one we've seen smaller, but then they can go up to uh, 55,000 square feet, and there's one under construction right now that's going to be 800,000 square feet. Um, so when that comes online, you can just imagine the capacity that's going to be available there. Right now, the LPs are having a hard time meeting the demand for the medical uh, patients. But you can imagine when recreational comes online that we're going to see even greater demand, and so these LPs are gearing up. And that one with 800,000 square feet being built isn't the only one. There's others that are adding square footage. Seems like multi a new announcement comes in. All right, so here's a few more pictures I took. We've got in the top left, we've got uh, the mother plant being trimmed for creating new seedlings or new plants. And then the lower right, we've got a drying room. So that's the drying racks. And uh, they've got a whole vault. So once that's dried and ready to be shipped out, that dried cannabis pipe can go in a vault and it's you know, released uh, as it's ordered, it goes out daily shipments. Now, I also did, I said, a little more searching on the internet and I came up with this one. So, this is the other end of the spectrum between we've got the clean room here and the hazmat suits to a little different feeling there. So that's in California. Um, so it's not, what, it's not from around, it's not a picture I took, this is internet. 
Um, but I just thought it was just uh, too good to pass up. Um, and another one, also not a licensed producer. Now, I uh, also was fortunate enough in 2015 to get to uh, Colorado. Uh, I was curious about the situation down there. And so they do have, mm -hmm, I'll say, mom and pop style, small retail outlets. And there's a few chains as well, um, um, chains of stores. But this one is a sort of upscale dispensary in Aspen, Colorado. And uh, I thought it was interesting. So you're probably also aware that uh, just 11 months ago, there was a big raid of 43 dispensaries in Toronto. The police swooped down um, around the uh, middle of May, and some people were arrested. All the product was uh, taken away, shipped off in the trunks of the policemen's cars, and um, a lot of activity in the courts after that. You know, it's unfortunate this young lady here, if you can just barely make it out, she's in cuffs, um, and uh, it's, it'd be too bad to see these. Uh, teens or 20-somethings that are working perhaps a part-time job, summer job, and that would lead to a criminal record. So that's all changing, and I'm glad to see that it is. But today, this is the environment that we're living in. Okay, so there's, we talk about licensed producers, there's the end consumer, the patient, and in between, in some cases, there's the cannabis clinic. So those people who don't have a doctor, either they're, they're orphaned, they just don't have a family doctor, or they have an MD, but that person doesn't feel comfortable it's, uh, authorizing cannabis, or doesn't feel um, they have a conscientious objection to the concept of it. So there's these cannabis clinics, and they can help people to match them up with a doctor who will feel comfortable and will assess them for suitability for medical cannabis. And then further, these clinics can offer the, the educational component that a lot of people are seeking. Um, some clinics don't charge the patient anything, as long as the person has a valid uh, health card. There are some clinics will charge in the range of about $249 for those services. So the clinic that I am uh, working with, Canadian Cannabis Clinics, uh, works within the ACMPR and does not charge the patient anything for either the, the doctor's time or for the educational component. And not everybody gets this prescription. Not everyone gets, I should say that not everyone gets the authorization. Some do and some, some don't. Uh, depends if they meet the criteria. All right, let's talk about the brief history of cannabis in Canada. I'm going to go to the, uh, let's say, this the last, roughly last 100 years. I did the research on this, and it goes way back. People have been using cannabis um, since as long as we've been recording time, centuries into the millennia even. But I just went back to 1922. Let's talk about modern era. So there was a book released by a, a woman named Emily Murphy. She called The Black Candle. It was inflammatory. It was uh, talking about how the use of, of marijuana, it was the term at that time, turns people into homosexuals. Um, and it was part of the propaganda at the time that led to um, cannabis being added to the schedule of Opium and Narcotic Control Act. Moving on, in 1936, there was a highly publicized movie called Brief for Madness. I'm sure you've all heard the term before. Um, it was originally intended by the maker of the movie as a morality tale, uh, but then it was purchased by a different producer and recut into a more of an exploitation film. Um, and it was, it, in some circles, it was called an anti-cannabis propaganda. The interesting thing is it gained some cult status in the 1970s. So then, it was kind of quiet for a while. Uh, prohibition of cannabis continued. And then, the, um, the Ledeen Commission, uh, the chairman was Gerald Ledeen, he was named to look into, uh, to create a commission of inquiry into the non-medical use of, of drugs. And what he found was that the commission recommended the decriminalization of simple cannabis possession and cultivation for personal purposes. But unfortunately, those recommendations were largely ignored. So again, we just sort of trundle along through the 70s, uh, at least in Canada. Um, I did note, um, and for those of you who uh, have been around long enough, you'll recall 1976, that the Netherlands effectively decriminalized marijuana. And that led to um, tourism of a sort, of people going to Amsterdam just to, for the novelty of it all. But back to Canada. So our Prime Minister, um, Trudeau Sr., dear Trudeau, um, told a group of students in 1977, if you have a joint and you're smoking it, for private pleasure, you shouldn't be counseled. So he was very laissez-faire about it, um, but uh, nonetheless, the laws did remain the same. 
And in fact, uh, enforcement of drug possession and drug use actually increased in the, e in the 80s in the USA and had a spillover effect in North Canada as well in the 80s. So, in the year 2000, the courts ruled that Canadians have a constitutional right to use cannabis as medicine. It's a landmark decision. And the way the judge uh, turned it, and I paraphrase here, the judge said, a person should not have to choose between symptom relief and going to jail. And that was really how it was laid out in the court case, and the judge agreed with the court that the laws as they existed were unconstitutional. So that put um, the cannabis possession, cannabis use in a, in a, in a predicament. Um, so, so the Harper government said, OK, we've got to do something about this. We were mandated to do something. So they introduced a marijuana for medical access regulations. And what that did is it granted legal access to cannabis for people with HIV, AIDS, and certain other illnesses. And so authorized patients can grow their, at that point, they could grow their own plants. They were allowed. So they were allowed to legally continue what they'd already been doing. Or they could obtain the plant from someone called a designated person, which was, there was licensing going through paperwork, so there was a designated person for the ill person. Uh, or someone with, who was allowed could purchase from a specific producer who was authorized by Health Canada. And at that time, it was called Prairie Plant Systems. It was in Saskatoon. So that was the only three ways to do it. And at the time, the writers of the legislation thought, well, that'll do the trick. We're, we're good to go. Um, but uh, it didn't work out. So uh, in the meantime, so moving along in the laterally with the action in the USA, some states were stepping up and starting to legalize cannabis as well. We had Colorado and Washington in 2012 with that. For small amounts for personal use for, on the recreational side. Now, um, some things changed. So new regulations changed the medical marijuana access rules, shifting to licensed commercial growers for supply and away from the home grows. By this time, 37,000 people were authorized to possess marijuana under the federal program, and that was up from fewer than 100 in 2012, or sorry, 2001. So the government just did not recognize just the, or rather the interest from people that were going to uh, want to take them off on the MMAR regulations. Um, so the federal government felt that, that due to the unforeseen growth of its medical marijuana program, that it, the, it is seriously compromised um, and the goal of providing the drug to patients while ensuring public safety. So in other words, there were concerns about diversion. So people were allowed to grow, I believe it was, let's say, 10 plants at a time under the NMAR, and the Health Canada people greatly um, underestimated um, what the output of 10 plants was. So what <coughs> was happening was that um, uh, marijuana or cannabis was being diverted away from the person who was, who was supposed to benefit from it, and uh, there was there was, it was ended up uh, in places it wasn't intended to be. So uh, the rise of uh, activism, because a lot of people didn't like these changes to this NMPR, which effectively told them, stop doing what you're doing. So we had some activism, some demonstrations in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, the woman on the right is Jody Emery. She's uh, having, saying let's free her husband, Mark, who was jailed. This was in the USA. He was jailed for selling seeds in the USA. But the action in Canada, the uprising, was all happening there. Another example of the, of the uh, demonstrations. So, next one things. I said they heated up before, well now they really heated up. So between 2014, and it should be true to 2016, with a lot of things were happening. So over those three year period, patients and producers authorized under the old regulations were required to destroy stocks of cannabis and cannabis seeds. And Although the federal court granted a temporary injunction allowing continued use of homegrown medical cannabis until legal arguments can be heard. So it was a buying time period during that, uh, those few years because uh, we were in this, as I say, in this um, in-between zone. So uh, people didn't hold back. There's April 20th, there's 420 celebrations last year, well, yeah, 2016, and they aired this out in the open, and um, it, was, um, it was allowed, it was tolerated. Um, people weren't, there weren't crackdowns, people weren't taken thousands to jail that day. Um, but you can see the groundswell of interest to, to move to the recreational side. And also to have access for people with medical patients that have access to the world. So the Allaire decision came out in, in 2016. So Allaire versus the Queen, what that meant, what, there was injunctive, injunctive relief 
granted by Judge Manson to those previously licensed under the MMAR within certain dates. The MMPR declared unconstitutional by the BC Superior Court. Declaration suspended for six months to allow government time to respond to ruling and reincorporate personal production. Okay, so what do we do? We've got the old MMAR, we have the current MMPR, which also was challenged. So the government of the day came up with yet another iteration of what to do. And so we got the ACMPR, which is the system I talked about in the first section. But then we've got even another level coming up, and that's this. So just uh, two, three weeks ago, April 13th, a bill to legalize cannabis by July 1st, 2018, was introduced to Parliament. It would allow for use by individuals 18 and over and possession of 30 grams of cannabis. Provinces could further restrict possession, sale, and use. And that's the big question is what is that distribution going to be like? How is it going to be sold, dis distributed? Is it going to be um, privately held dispensaries? Is it going to be an LCBO model? Um, is it going to be a mixture of both, private and public? Uh, for instance, the wines in Ontario, wine and beer can be sold outside of a LCBO, a beer store, and you can get it at the grocery store and go to the wine rack. So we're wondering, what's it all going to look like? And nobody has the answers, there's no crystal ball, but believe me, that discussion is happening. Just about every time I come into a group like this yesterday as an example. Uh, we had a lot of the industry players here and there's a lot of speculation about what is that going to look like. So we don't know, but it's on everybody's mind to know. All right, let's look at data on current use and attitudes. So I, further I did a search. I came up with three studies that address these uh, questions. One is about cannabis use in the past year. So Health Canada released uh, 2015 Canadian Tobacco, Alcohol, and Drug Survey, the CTADS results. Similar data was released in 2013, and the sample size was 15,000 people. It was done in uh, November of 2016. So what they found out was, interestingly, that, look here, so it shows about 10% of people, right here, 10% of people over 25 were using cannabis in the last year, but 30% people in the 20 to 24 age group were using cannabis last year. And by far, that's the, the largest user. And it does concern some people that there's three times the usage rate in that age group, <coughs> 20 to 24. Because as we know, the brain is still developing at that time. Nonetheless, that was the survey results so far. Moving on. So by gender, males have always been uh, obese and females in the usage of cannabis. And that's um, shown here in the graph. I'll be interested to see the data in 2017 when that comes out. It was a sequential, 2013, 2015, 2017. And then the next um, breakout of data is by province. And you can see that uh, Prince Edward Island in 2015 had the lowest rates of cannabis use. And at the other end, uh, British Columbia had the highest rates of cannabis use. And that bears out with anecdotal evidence that I've seen as well. A lot of the craft growers, a lot of the people in the MMAR come out of BC. And they're very good at it. So, moving on. The, the next study that I came across was from the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse. And in their paper from April 2016, the Canadian Drug Summary, they point out, and rightly so, that cannabis is not a benign drug that there are risks and harms associated with its use. There's been a slight decrease in cannabis use among the Canadian general population since 2008. They also point out that although cannabis use among Canadian youth aged 15 to 24 has been declining since 2008, as I said, their use is three times higher than adults. And the rate of daily cannabis use among the Canadian general population remains steady. Now, uh, a third study involved 1,256 people, and it uh, was put out by Forum Research Incorporated. And their highlights, and this is about attitudes going forward, about what people are saying the law should look like. And the majority, that is close to six in 10 people, approve of the Liberal government's promise to legalize tax and regulate marijuana. And that has been moving up steadily since, uh, ever since the data that I've seen going back, and it used to be, 25% were in favor of recreational legalization, 30, 35, 45, and so on, and now we're at 59%. And that tide turned, I want to say about 
three, three to four years ago is when I saw it tip over the 50% mark. Next highlight from that study is that when asked how legal marijuana should be produced and sold, the largest group opts for a distribution system where large corporate growers only are licensed to grow marijuana and it is sold through government agencies like liquor boards. And that group is 45%. It was the largest single-minded group. The other groups were something less than 45% as there are different options laid out. So just fewer than one-fifth of those surveyed have used cannabis in the past year. So 18% have used in the last year. It's interesting, a friend of mine's a police officer, and in his line of work as being a police officer and also as a landlord, his take on it is a little bit different. He, he found that his interactions with the people that he sees is more like about 40% of people using cannabis. So it depends who you ask, who you talk to. Um, so, so I want to make sure that I feel that I'm getting the right data. So I like this study because it's over 1,200 people were asked. Whereas um, uh, anecdotally, you can talk to people and maybe get a bit of a skewed idea if your sample size is um, not broadly representative. So I always keep that in mind. But if you ask a police officer, they might say around 40%. Just saying. All right, next thing is, so if, if cannabis is legalized in Canada, more than one-tenth of those who do not use marijuana now are likely to use it. That's 13%. And about one-twentieth are very likely to do so. So this shows you that it's the illegality is holding some people back from choosing cannabis as a recreational option. Um, I also, this is my personal opinion, but I, in my conversations with people, think that people will choose alcohol less often as a recreational drug and choose cannabis more often. They'll cut back their alcohol and they'll choose cannabis a little more. I think that's true. And the people I've talked to who unfortunately have been um, down the path of some levels of drug addiction, say alcoholism, for example, have said it's to them. Again, I'm just stating this is stories. This is not based in science or data of that nature. But they say, you know, if I had to choose one or the other, it's, they say I find the cannabis way less harmful to my life than the alcohol, to my morbidity, to my quality of life. So, parting words. I'm going to leave that to um, the president of Forum Research. He's the head of the third of the three. Um, the three studies I just presented. This is what he says. His name is Lauren Wozniak. Canadians want to see cannabis strictly licensed and controlled, not grown in basements and sold in corner stores. The size of the market is good news for the potential industry players waiting to open shop here. And that was November 2015. So that was his statement. And this is all available on the, uh, on the web. I've got sources, references for everybody who wants to look at it. Now, I did say it has some additional information. If you want to go to Health Canada's website, there's information for patients there, there's information for physicians, and as well, there's the Colleges of Family uh, Physicians of Canada and for uh, the CPSO for Canada as well. Okay, so what we have discussed, we talked about the ACM Bureau legislation, so the system as it exists today. We've talked about the British history, history of cannabis in Canada going back to 1922. And we talked about current attitudes and uh, usage of cannabis. And there's the additional information um, that you can, uh, by all means, look up. And there's a lot of information there. I strongly recommend it. And so I do want to thank Canadian Cannabis Clinics. And Cannabis Rx is the counseling arm. And GH Red Consulting for um, uh, uh, generous contributions to make this presentation possible. And one last thing I want to offer up. I have some time. I can answer some questions. And uh, that's me on the top right on a Trip. I just came back from uh, South Africa on Thursday night and uh, then to flew directly to Ottawa. So I was there for a couple of weeks. So I'm just sort of still, still feel like I'm getting, getting my leg, my sea legs back under me for uh, timing. Okay, so thanks very much. I am open to any questions if you have. Any questions.